I'm Pat Dunn, and this is another philosophy video. Uh, in this video, I'd like to talk about the concept of uh, the concepts of erasure, categories, identity, and things of that, uh, things along those lines. So, I think that the distinction between categories and identities is pretty important. Um, each of us, when we, when we go out to understand the rest of the universe, we put things, uh, things into categories. We build concepts that have certain delimiters to them. What does it mean for something, for example, to be a chair? And somebody might say that a wood stump is a chair if you're using it uh, as one. Another person might say, no, it actually has to be built with the intent to be a chair and using it as a chair is not the same thing as it being a chair. Now, there, there's an interesting distinction there. Uh, I do have a, a way, or I, I do have a position between those two, but I see how people use language as being a, a fairly personal thing, and there's a lot of philosophy hiding behind a lot of these terms. And it's, a, it's a personal kind of philosophy. It's not necessarily a very high-grade type of philosophy, but philosophy is about the general domain of life. It's, it's our attempt to understand the universe, to parse it, to work with it. And we, we do have particular fields that we, we also call philosophy that are more specific, talking about morals, ethics, logic, epistemology, things like that, but because philosophy is the general domain, I, I, I think that we should expect everyone is doing philosophy to some extent, uh, whether they admit it or not. And also, there isn't necessarily a lot of reason to insist that people use words in quite the same way. Like in the example that I gave above, uh, well, I, I should not probably shouldn't be in the habit of saying above when I'm I'm used to blogging and uh, in blogging uh, above would be before, but in this case I really mean before. Um, it really isn't important whether people use uh, use the term chair in quite the same way because for in the general case people will understand each other despite not. Having uh, not having all their concepts line up the same way, and there's a uh, there are differences in, in the nuances of language, uh, subtle meanings, uh, preferences to use phrases in a certain way versus a tendency to use them more broadly. You'll see regional variations, maybe variations within a family, um, certainly variations between dialects of. Uh, uh, of the same language. And so long as the general cases line up well enough, then it, it doesn't matter when you have uh, when you have differences that aren't aren't that essential. And I expect that kind of linguistic variation. I think it's a healthy thing. I worry when I see people dig back to the original meaning of words that they're uh, that you, you sometimes end up seeing this kind of linguistic fundamentalism, this idea that uh, I found the Latin or the Greek or the the Parsi or uh, or the the origin of this this word as it was originally used, and uh, and I insist that you use it that way because that's correct. And that ends up being, I mean, in some great cases, it ends up being weird because words like terrible and terrific, they originally, if, if you dig to their roots, they should have much more similar meanings. But sometime, I think in the 17th or 16th century, you ended up having, uh, having a pretty severe meaning drift. Um, and, and in other cases, it, it's just kind of irritating because they're trying to constrain use of language. Uh, so it's, it's not necessarily that I think that there's a right answer and they're in the wrong, but rather 
I expect linguistic diversity to, to generally be a good thing. And in the general case, I think unless somebody's being malicious, you should probably uh, let them frame their world of terms in the way they want without hassling them over it. Uh, you should expect that they won't use the, uh, words the same ways, that they might have different types of categories, that they might not talk about things in quite the same way that you do, even when it's something that's really important to you. And, and I'll, I'll give two examples, um, the first of which, and I might have covered this in another video, so apologies if it's, uh, if it's a repeat, but for example, the first example would be Mormons who claim to be Christians, and some Christians disagree. They get into all sorts of uh, arguments about doctrine and is the Nicene Creed or is one of the other uh, ideas really defining what essentially what Christianity is and does that place Mormon uh, uh, Mormonism outside Christianity or not? And Mormons generally will will make the claim that that they are Christians and that their faith is Christian. Um, and and yeah, there are some people who disagree, and I think it's fine that they disagree. I don't need to take a stance. I might decide to take a stance, but I don't have to. And I I just think it's a definitional matter, uh, and I'm I'm happy to work with whatever framework somebody's uh, somebody's talking with because I don't don't actually have much of an opinion if I did then either we would each end up speaking from our own frameworks or we would uh, adopt one for the sake of either a conversation or for, for all of our interactions we'd, we'd figure something out if it really became essential to talk about this in, de in depth uh, with someone most likely uh, I would say uh, this person claims them to be Christian, this person claims them not to be, and use the, the claim language uh, rather than get engrossed. And I, I, recog uh, I recognize that that can get awkward if, if you have to do that for enough terms, but uh, I mean it's, just, it's part of dealing with different, pers uh, different perspectives, different frameworks of thought. And the second example uh, is one in which I frequently get into arguments with uh, some flavors of my f uh, fellow liberals on, which is recognition of transsexuality. And as I said, I, uh, I don't recognize it, uh, but I, I mean, I, I still recognize the humanity of the people who claim to be transsexual and want to treat them decently but I want to treat them decently without giving up my definitional framework or the way that I view the world. Uh, and so I, I think that it's perfectly fine. And I do happen to, to use whatever pronouns, well, I, I'll, I'll use whatever he or she pro, uh, pronoun that they happen to, uh, to prefer. Although I don't think that it would be rude not to. I can respect them as a person without respecting their identity choices because I, I have my world of, of terms that I'm working with. They have theirs. They can use whatever they want. I'll use whatever I want, even when the topic is them. Now, now some people, uh, they, they do make a claim that people should be obligated uh, for just for the topic of somebody's self-identity you're obliged to adopt whatever world of terms they're most comfortable with. I reject that categorically across all domains. Um, I might be willing to do it in some areas as a courtesy or as a conscious choice. For example, generally with names, if somebody gives me, uh, tells me their name is something, I'll use, I'll use their name with the exception that if their name is particularly obnoxious, if it's not pronounceable, if it's really, really long, uh, and certainly if it's written and they're, uh, they're just being uh, difficult, like the artist formerly known as Prince, who actually had the weird uh, symbol thing, uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And if they're going to be that 
special uh, that I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not going to play along. But gen generally, I will play along with uh, with uh, he or she. And but I just but that is a conscious choice. It's not reprehensible not to do that. And in the past, I didn't do that. Uh, it's just uh, it's a shift based on something complicated that I'm not going to get into right now. But it, it wasn't a choice for the sake of making them comfortable because I reject the idea of shifting language, shifting our world of, uh, shifting one's world of terms to make other people comfortable. You should, uh, if somebody ever demands that you do that, they're being rude. Now to, to get back to the, uh, to the distinction between categories and identities, Identity, so a, a category is just a decision to have a concept uh, that describes a certain type of something. And generally, you, you have the essence of whatever it is that you're describing, and you have, uh, you have criteria that either all need to be met or mostly need to be met, or otherwise it delimits a border of whatever the sphere of things is that you're talking about. Like for cats, you might decide, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm giving a bad example because we, we have better ways to define cat, but for cat, we might decide uh, four legs, pointy ears, uh, shortish face, tail, um, a certain amount of hair, uh, and maybe a certain shape of the face. And and so you, you would uh, either something is a cat or it's not. It, it would either fit in the category or it doesn't. And there are some categories that might have fuzzy borders, um, but that that's the purpose of a category. Now, when it comes to an identity, identities are things that that people have, and it's it's a, identities have more of a social meaning to them. They're one we've decided to invest part of our uh, public persona into one of the categories that we happen to place ourselves in. Like someone decides I'm an artist, that's part of my identity. Uh, I'm, I think of myself as an artist, um, I'm going to talk about myself as an artist, I like being seen as an artist, uh, and so on. And, uh, and then there are, so not every, not every category that uh, I mean, completely aside from the fact that not everybody uh, has the same definitional borders for categories, or even some people might not even have some categories that uh, are really, really important to other people, like saved versus unsaved. For me, those categories are empty because I don't believe in the idea of being saved in the religious sense. But for other people, those categories are essential, and they really want to be seen as one of the saved, they want to live that life, it's part of the meaning that they, they have for their life. And I, I don't, uh, my lack of recognition of the category also means that I don't recognize the identity, if, if they've made it an identity. Some people uh, just might be quiet about it, and in which case it's more of a self-identity. But take for example uh, someone who has red hair. Some people who have red hair might decide to identify as a redhead, and they might have a whole lot of ideas about what it means to be a redhead. They might have this idea about a culture, about personality traits that they're supposed to have. They might have a, it, they might have become normative about this identity. Um, and other people who have red hair might just might not ever think about it. Um, or they might dye their hair, or uh, they, if, if it's not part of how they see themselves, how they live their lives, uh, I mean on, on a high intellectual level, if it's not a really very conscious thing uh, for them, then they'd probably just be categorized as, as having red hair, but they might not really have any type of a recognizable uh, red-haired identity. And for me, like for example, I don't eat meat, um, and so by category, I I define myself as vegetarian. But 
I almost never think about uh, vegetarianism. It's not a meaningful category for how I think about people. Um, it's not a very conscious thing. I just I don't like the smell or taste of meat. Um, I wasn't always a vegetarian. I dated a vegan for a few years, uh, some years back, and just lost my taste for meat. And so I stopped eating it. And it's not like I, I would feel bad for eating meat. It's uh, it's not even like the only times that I ever really think about it are when I, I'm in a restaurant where I just, uh, and it's a, a brief thought, I'm going to scoot to the vegetarian section or I need to to look for foods that uh, that I like to eat, or um, or when I'm in the supermarket and I might not enjoy smelling uh, the slabs of fish or beef or whatever it is that they have on the shelves there. But even then, I, I tend it rarely trickles up into whatever whatever my current mind state is. And and sometimes I get into conversations with other people if I'm eating with them in a restaurant. And then it might be mentioned as uh, as a term, vegetarianism, but otherwise it just doesn't really matter uh, to me. And so I would say, yeah, I categorize myself as vegetarian, but I don't really have a vegetarian identity. Uh, same thing with, with my sexuality, in that I'm categorized as, as bisexual, but I have not... I've never really thought about, I don't tend to think about it that much as an identity. It's uh, it's not something that I talk about a lot. Um, it's not something I'm ashamed of, uh, but it's, it's, just, it's not something that I've chosen to make my life in any sense about. Not that I think that it's wrong to, to have these things as identities. It's just uh, they these things are not things that I've chosen to take as, as identities, and in this ca in the case of of not being uh, straight, this often goes into a, uh, into a further dimension, and I guess it does with vegetarianism too. In that, you often end up having people who associate with each other because they share the same identities, and you get a certain type of culture, and sometimes you get ideas that float around between them. Um, uh, and like vegetarians might prefer hanging out with each other or uh, or you often end up having like queer culture, things like that. I've never really felt much of a desire to take part in these things. Um, uh, and in some case, particularly in the case of, of queer culture, I've often strongly disagreed with a lot of the ideas that came out of particular queer cultures. And, but... Uh, again, it's, it's just I don't share the identity even if I share the category. Um, and so, moving on to, to the final topic in this, uh, there's this idea of erasure. And a number of activist communities are really bothered when they don't see members of whether, uh, whatever identity slash category they they happen to hold dear being represented in various forms of media. Now, in, in some cases, this is this is very conspicuous and it's kind of weird. Like, take for example, race. If you ended up having uh, having a TV show where absolutely everybody were the same race, it might feel kind of kind of weird at, at least in a multicultural society like the United States um, it would feel uh, I mean in, in a multi-ethnic society like the United States it would feel kind of weird to see a TV show where absolutely everybody is white or absolutely everybody is black or uh, absolutely everybody is uh, oriental or, or something like that um, it, it wouldn't always be out of place. I mean, there are certainly ethnic neighborhoods in New York City where almost everybody is of the same ethnicity. But eventually, you're, you're going to see other people on you know, in any reasonably diverse uh, media, and so it's it's kind of conspicuous not seeing it. For other identities, like um, like uh, not being straight. Uh, 
or I don't know, not not seeing oneself as trans or uh, religious diversity. Oftentimes, these things just might not come up, and so you could have a reasonable slice of whatever whatever the setting is without seeing uh, whatever type of diversity uh, that that one might expect. And I think that's fine. Uh, I mean, I think it, it's it's fine if you have the diversity in media. It's sometimes a little bit weird if you don't. I don't think it's anything worth shouting over. Just gets a little weird um, for some kinds of diversity, but for a lot of people, I mean, I, I mentioned that there are some activist communities that get angry if people don't use the same terms to frame them that they use to frame themselves, and I think that that's invalid uh, because I, I think that everybody generally should use whatever framing that they're comfortable with, provided they, that they have no malice. And even if they, they have malice in certain circumstances, like in the case of uh, case of religion or politics, a certain amount of at least disagreement, uh, competitive aim to win in the long run, that, that kind of malice is not exactly the right word, but that, that kind of um, conflict is, is to be expected. But um, but in, in general, I, I think you should expect mental diversity along those lines. Uh, don't uh, yeah, so yeah. Don't try not to be a douche to people, and certainly don't harass them or beat them up. But you're not obligated to pick up their their world of terms. Uh, when it comes to feeling represented in various kinds of media, I think that generally that's not necessary either, particularly because. Uh, Often when you do end up having uh, token inclusion in these works, you end up having this kind of uh, assorted nuts type cast where everybody has one thing that's that's quirky about them. And here's uh, Jane, she's a schizophrenic. And here's uh, Joe, he's um, kind of worried about the government. And here's... Uh, Annie, and she's um, she has a crippling fear of commitment. And here's uh, Jake, and he's clingy. And here's Alan, and he's black. And that last one feels a little bit weird because you've taken. You, I mean, it, first off, it's kind of weird in, in general to characterize someone by one trait, but you you've also taken. And, uh, and uh, a category, a, a category about personality, mixed it with a demographic one, as if that fills some kind of a requirement, and that that's kind of weird. Um, no, I get, I'm not necessarily saying it's the the worst thing in the world to do, but it's something that you might you might prefer not to see uh, a category like that as uh, as being all of the characterization that you're giving, even if you've decided to, uh, to give just a little bit of characterization to everybody. Beca uh, particularly because saying that somebody is of a certain ethnicity really doesn't say a lot about them. It doesn't say as much as the other characterizations that, I've, that I gave in that token example, at least. Um, and so... There's a, there's this worry about erasure, uh, about um, about some category just being treated as if it doesn't exist, and I think that that's generally fine uh, for many types of categories. Uh, the so when it comes to social justice, the the path that I've generally advocated is one where you try and think about what uh, what you're what you're aiming at first and then you figure out how you get there and uh, and then you you engage with with uh, trying to change the world and usually it's a slow thing although if there are legal changes to make it can it can be a uh, much faster paced and I generally don't think it's helpful to get into these extended analyses of 
intersectional oppression or or privilege or um, or, or things like that. I I think that there are need, needless complications on an already complicated topic and they stir up emotions without adding anything useful for the cost. And, and I'm happy to pay the cost of stirring up emotions. There are areas where there are established um, advantages for, uh, for people that are, are long uh, that have long been present that probably should be peeled back. And like legal privileging for a given religion, that would be uh, an example of one of these. Uh, and yeah, it, it should be peeled back. Um, but that's the one kind of privilege that I think is worth talking about. Uh, not the idea of uh, you happen to be of a certain ethnicity uh, your, that ethnicity is dominant in our society. Therefore, when you're arguing, you have a privilege uh, over that, like there's straight privilege or uh, something like that. I don't care about that. That's uh, uninteresting, unhelpful. It's a waste of time in an argument. Uh, and activists should just cut it out uh, there. If you have to explain to people that they don't have certain life experiences, just explain what they're missing, and they'll pick it up. Calling them privileged based on their background, A, it's an attempt to disqualify them from entering the discussion, and B, it's going to piss them off. Uh, and ideally, you're, you're trying to get people to listen to you. So patient explaining as high a burden as that can be is the way that you do that. Um, and so when it, when it comes to erasure, I, I think generally what we're aiming for in a society is where a lot of these distinctions either matter less or they don't matter. Uh, I, if, and that's really what tolerance is about. Tolerance, uh, intolerance doesn't look like I I've, I don't have the same categories in the world for things that you do and I speak differently than you do about gender or race or something um, and I've never I don't have a special category for Kazyrgyzstanis that's separate from Uzbekistanis that's not what intolerance is intolerance is uh, I will not tolerate your being here. Uh, I'm going to attempt to stamp you out. Uh, and it's, it's generally, it's a personal thing. Uh, intolerance works, it does work against the community, but it works against it through people, and it's at the level of people that our treatment needs to be focused. There are all sorts of privileges that people might like to create for particular communities. And in general, I think that we should re resist those calls. We should resist entangling our activism with these ideas of recognition. You don't need to recognize all of a person's identities to treat them decently. You don't need to share categories, to share ways of, uh, to share language practices to treat them decently. Um, if a, a person of race A being tolerant of a person of race B, at best, is a person of race A not caring about the the race of uh, uh, the race of the person of race B, and them seeing each other as humans, them not harassing each other, uh, them getting along, them being as willing to hire each other as other people of of race A, them. At, being willing to accurately consider the skills of them, them, uh, them maybe being willing to to, uh, to build friendships uh, across whatever those boundaries are. And it doesn't necessarily mean that A and B are quite the same in all their details, because you do have culture confounding uh, race. You do have ethnic communities, and not everyone who's of a certain race uh, race as a category belongs to the 
racial identity or the, the racial community or one of the racial communities for that race. And that's fine. Uh, and maybe we might want to criticize some of the communities or even criticize the identity, but ideally uh, we're going to tolerate the category. And that's the basis of, of tolerance and that's the basis of respect. The respect shouldn't mean that um, that identities are sacrosanct or worth tiptoeing around. It shouldn't mean that uh, the cultures or that communities are immune from criticism, but it should mean that we tolerate each other. That's, that's what tolerance is. And so erasure is, just doesn't figure into that, con uh, into that concern. So in general, erasure is a form of tolerance. Erasure is, uh, is fine. Um, now this doesn't mean uh, that we can necessarily jump all the way there. We can put part of our brain there. We can live as ourselves throughout the vast majority of our daily lives, just ignoring a lot of the distinctions that exist between people. But an area where I think we do have obligations if we care about social justice is that when we see other people being intolerant, um, if we had somebody, if we had, uh, had if we worked in a company and we had a friend who was working in human resources and they were uh, in the hiring department and they thought, well, people of this ethnicity, they're just not trustworthy, so I wouldn't hire them to handle the finances. That's an area where I think that there's a big problem and we can't just filter that out of our speech because we're already beyond really caring a lot about these distinctions. We need to be willing to keep an eye out for that kind of thing and take corrective measures, talk to the person. And if you still don't think that they're going to be fair, then you probably should try and get them away from that position where they would be abusing their power. And and, and there are a lot of similar examples, but uh, we have to keep an ear out for injustice, but we have to be also be careful not to have that ear cast so widely that we misperceive what injustice is. Uh, and again, we should focus on employment, we should focus on legal equality, uh, we should focus on harassment, uh, things along those lines. And harassment narrowly construed. There, there are people who have a really, really broad notion of harassment. Uh, and I covered this in a previous video, but harassment has to involve repeated unwanted uh, contact after uh, somebody has been asked not to do something. And that request needs to be reasonable. And that, that understood, like somebody says, please stop hitting on me, and the person keeps on hitting on them incessantly, Harassment, clearly. Um, somebody flirts with you and you don't, and you don't like it. Not harassment, clearly. There are muddy cases in between. You flirt with somebody, they give you a really dirty look, and you keep on doing it. Harassment, eh, maybe it's kind of iffy. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so in any case, I, I think I've covered the topics that I wanted to cover with this. Again, distinct, distinction between categories and identity, important. Um, importance of people uh, having, feeling comfortable perceiving the world as they choose and speaking from whatever conceptual categories that they've, uh, they've come up with. Good. Diversity uh, in use of language, good. Um, erasure, usually fine, sometimes a little bit weird. Um, and uh, tolerance defined uh, reasonably. So I'm happy to discuss this further with you on any of these specifics. Um, keep it civil, and that's all.